Time now, 24 and a half minutes after 8 o'clock. I'm Brian Curtis. This is Money for Nothing. And Renita Malhotra Hora, our contributor and producer, joins me in the studio now. Renita, good morning. Good morning, Brian. So China consumes more than half of the world's iron ore. Tell me more about it. Well, while demand is rising and, you know, looks like it will continue to climb through 2020, the rate of increase is slowing. However, we're told that iron ore producers are undeterred by slowing growth in China. So joining me to discuss this is IRC Limited Executive Chairman Jay Hambro. Good morning, Jay. Welcome to the show. Good morning. So, Jay, tell us why is it that iron ore producers are undeterred despite the slowing growth in China? I wouldn't uh, fully subscribe to the view of slowing growth. Uh, we are a company on the Sino-Russian border, and we have an expanding market base as our production grows. So um, I don't think the, uh, the, the growth is slow for everyone. Um, I think that the rate of growth uh, in demand overall in China obviously has, has slowed, but it's still at a pretty respectable pretty close to 8%, and uh, that means people are growing, people are building, and iron ore is, is a fundamental ingredient for any growth. So uh, China, of course, has been a historical importer of iron ore, but there are many companies now, such as yourselves, who are actively developing projects within the mainland. Can you tell us about that? Yes, yeah, so China has been the biggest swing factor for iron ore over the last uh, three to five years. The growth in demand, the growth in steel production, and consequent demand for for iron ore has been has been pretty phenomenal. Um, the iron ore market, though, has always been dominated by uh, three producers. So two thirds of the world's iron ore comes from a company called Vale in Brazil, mm -hmm. Rio Tinto, and BHP Bulletin in in Australia. And uh, what you've seen is the market move to more transparent, uh, quarterly, monthly, and, and even spot priced environment moving away from the annual pricing agreements set by those three and a growth uh, among smaller producers like Fortescue in Australia and, and even down the curve like IRC itself on the on the Sino-Russian border. Now your plants, uh, are all of your operational plants on the border within Russia or, you, or do you have something actually active within China? So we have uh, our Kuranak mine, uh, which is just across the border uh, in, in Russia. Um, we started production there when we IPO'd in 2010. Uh, we're now at full capacity there, producing just over a million tons a year. And all of that iron ore comes across from Russia into China. Um, we also have two downstream uh, projects within the mainland, one with our largest consumer where we produce a product called vanadium. Um, and we also have a, an exploration, well, an early stage asset in the uh, titanium business um, doing the same thing. Uh, Jay, Br uh, Brian here. Uh, do you get a feeling that demand is, is uh, increasing now? And what does demand for your product tell you you think about overall growth in the economy? Because we have this sort of sense that, you know, everything was built up to overcapacity and it, it takes a while before you kind of grow into the capacity that's been already built out. Sure, Brian. Um, I, I think it's a very good question because iron ore is, is obviously an indicator for growth because iron ore is a fundamental, in, fundamental ingredient uh, for construction. Uh, it's a good leader to look at. And the iron ore price environment has been pretty buoyant this year. We are up 12% so far uh, to date this year, and about 25% since the lows uh, last October. So uh, yes, I think it's an indicator of, of future growth or consolidation in the sector. Um, specific to our sector, uh, you saw the, the, the price go down in October, as I said. It reached a level of about $110, $115 a ton, which I think is probably a, uh, a floor price based on that being the, the marginal cost of supply. Um, and I think looks things look more exciting going forward. But does it go into airports that are not used and bridges that go to nowhere? Or does it feel as though you know we're sort of growing into uh, that, that, that build-out? Well, so we are, we are uh, increasing our production nearly five times over the next couple of years. So we've spent a lot of time looking at, at market. Uh, we supply mainly into, into Dongbei, into the northeast of, of China. There is a shortfall there of 20 million tons that China is importing into that area. So if we produce 10 million tons, we are only half of that shortfall. And you do see growth. We just expanded our customer base with 20% um, of our production going to one new 
uh, customer in the northeast. Um, our material has been tested by 10 different uh, steel producers and they wouldn't be doing that uh, and investing heavily in, in broadening their supply base if they didn't think the market was exciting going forward. And what are the growth industries that are actually driving this? I mean, you mentioned stainless steel, and of course there's infrastructure and construction, but beyond that, what are the other industries that are, you know, uh, really creating this demand? So our largest customer produces something called rebar, uh, which is uh, used in the construction sector, um, which in the northeast is, is in boom time. Um, you know, the city of, of Harbin uh, is a city that's scheduled to treble over the next uh, few years. Um, the mayor tells me very proudly that's all funded. Um, it, is, uh, it is a space where I think, not well, unique in China, but it's one of the, the lesser talked about uh, areas of China in the, in the media where growth is pretty exciting. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on the show. That's Jay Hambro, the executive chairman of IRC Limited.